Um, welcome everyone and thank you for coming to the presentation of the Shaking Layers tool. My name is Tatiana Godet, I'm a seismologist at GNS Science and I am the Shaking Layers project leader. And uh, here is the outline of the webinar. Um, first, um, we'll give you an, in an introduction to all the panelists here today. Um, then uh, Nick Hospul, who's the uh, technical leader, he will uh, present uh, the Shaking Layers tool to all of you. And then we will go into, into the Q&A. Uh, you can uh, use the Q&A option uh, to write any questions at any time. And uh, thank you. I'll pass it on to Nick now. I'm the Shaking Layers technical lead for the project. Yarakoto. Uh, I'm Anna Kaiser. I am the science manager for the Shaking Layers project, helping to coordinate the cross program science that goes into Shaking Layers. Kia ora koutou. Paul Elizabeth Abbott Tokwingwa. I am the products and services manager at GNS and I have been the GNS business manager for the Shaping Layer project. Uh, kia ora, my name is Jeremy Holtham and I am the user experience designer within GNS. Hi, my name is um, Joshua Groom. I'm an uh, architect on this project. Kia ora koutou. my name is Danielle Charlton. I am a hazard risk scientist at GNS and I am the Shaking Layers end user liaison. All right, thanks team for the introductions. Now we'll uh, start off with the with the presentation uh, overview of what Shaking Layers is and this, this new tool from GeoNet. So Shaking Layers is, is a new tool that we've developed and uh, deployed on GeoNet. And it's a, um, what it does is it generates maps of ground shaking intensity following an earthquake. So you may ask, why do we need a tool like this? Well, at the moment, if you want to get information on shaking intensity uh, on GeoNet, you have a few ways to do that. So one is you can use the felt reports. So these are submitted by members of the public. Uh, in real time uh, following an earthquake and GeoNet produces maps like shown on the top left uh, of shaking as felt by the public from felt reports. The other way you can get shaking information is through uh, the station data. So this is our seismometer network across the country and you can get information on the shaking at those particular stations. And typically you can get uh, engineering based intensity uh, metrics that come out of um, the recordings from those stations. But there's a bit of a gap in information if you want to know what the shaking is between some of those felt reports or between those stations across the country. And so Shaking Layers is a tool that produces maps of shaking right across the country so you can get that shaking information anywhere in the country. What shaking layers looks like is shown down the bottom left, where we have a map um, of, uh, of shaking from a recent earthquake uh, near Porongahau on the east coast of the North Island. Shaking layers use, uses the latest science models and data that we have within GNS science, and it co combines observed ground motions from our station network and our felt reports with predictive models to estimate the shaking intensity. And so we combine this, these two different types of information to create these maps. To do this analysis, we use the ShakeMap software that's been developed and released as open source software from the United States Geologic Survey. Shaking Layers has been co-designed with end users. The project has been running uh, nearly two years now, and we've designed it with end users from the technical group, such as yourselves, from the public, and with science as well. And we've done this through a number of different means, through surveys, focus groups, and advisory panels. So what can shaking layers be used for? Well, there's a large number of uses. So firstly, it can be used for situational awareness in different contexts. So it provides information on shaking distribution across the country. And so we can see the shaking intensity in different locations or different centers. 
as well as seeing the size and area of severe shaking that might cause damage. So it can be very useful for things like emergency response. It can also be used for triggering inspections. Because we have estimates of shaking across the country, if you are a owner of infrastructure or, or building assets or any other type of uh, uh, exposure elements across the country that might be exposed to shaking, you can get estimates of shaking at those locations. And this could be used to then trigger further steps such as inspections or other, other processes following an event. Shaking layers can also be used for research purposes. So if you're wanting information on shaking from previous events, that might go into things like correlating damage with shaking intensity. Uh, shaking layers can be used for that as well. And it can also be used as an input into other models, such as landslide or liquefaction triggering models, as well as our impact and risk models used to estimate uh, the impact following events. So shaking layers has a number of uses. As I mentioned earlier, it's been co-designed with end users. And we've done this in to, to ensure that what we have delivered in this tool meets the needs of a variety of end users. Early on in the project, we had workshops with technical end users from emergency management, from lifeline utility companies, uh, from researchers and insurance sector to scope the needs and requirements uh, in a tool such as this. Through these workshops, we developed um, a plan for, for the project, and we also went out with a public survey to ask them what they would like in a, a tool that produced shaking maps um, across the country. Following those two, uh, the workshop and the survey, we developed um, the requirements of the tool, and then we set up two panels to help us along the way to seek feedback as we were developing and working through the project. So the first was we created a science advisory panel, and this provided review and input into our science and model configurations and helped sense check what we were doing and provide confidence that we are delivering the tool with the latest science available. We also set up an end user advisory panel, which was primarily of technical end users. And these helped give us uh, feedback on what how they would use the tool and what sort of features they would like within it. As we developed the tool and developed beta products, the end user advisory panel also tested these and provided feedback. One of the key components to this project was developing what we call personas. And personas are different types of end users. And so through our workshops and, and surveys and our advisory panels, we develop personas that represent typical end users and we develop features and user stories for them and how they would use the tool. So for example, we could look at someone like an engineer and see that they wanted information rapidly within the first 30 minutes, and there might be a high requirement for accurate information in that time. And that helped us guide how what features we need within the Shaking Layers tool. So this project began back in October 2021, where we uh, realized that there was a need for such a tool. Prior to that, we had been generating these types of maps uh, following significant earthquakes manually. Uh, and we had heard from end users that they'd like this type of information provided in an automated setting within GeoNet. And that was really the catalyst for this project. In December 2021, we released the uh, public survey out to the public for, uh, uh, for feedback to gain those requirements from the general public. At the same time, we implemented the shake map software within GeoNet, and we were generating shake maps uh, automatically uh, for earthquakes internally from January 2022. So we've been running the system now for 18 months internally, so we have confidence in, in what we've developed. In April and May 2022, we developed those user personas, which was for the way that we would deliver the information. And in June 2022, we released the Shaking Layers data website and API in a beta version, which allowed some of our early adopters and technical end users on our advisory panel to test the product and provide feedback on that early version. We also started designing how we would implement Shaking Layers within the main GeoNet website, which required a large overhaul of how we present earthquake information. In September 2022, 
we developed an application that allowed GNS seismologists to manually update the map. So up to this point, everything was run automatically, but we often need for large and uh, significant earthquakes, the maps to be updated manually based on new science and interpretation. And we developed a way to do that in a seamless manner. So our expert earthquake experts panel, which is run within GNS science could update the maps following an event. Just this month, we've released Shaking Layers on the main GeoNet website, and that was released on Tuesday this week, which you may or may not have seen, but we'll provide the links to how you can access that information later in the webinar. Uh, we still have plans to uh, release some new features. So for example, we'll be releasing later this year or early 2024, uh, a way to view Shaking Layers on the GeoNet mobile app, and also how you can access them through a GIS web service. So how does Shaking Layers work? So I'm going to take you through a timeline of how Shaking Layers is generated within the GeoNet system and what you might expect if you're accessing this information following an earthquake. So first we record ground shaking at our network of seismometers and this goes into our earthquake location system within the National Geohazards Monitoring Center run in GeoNet. The NGMC uh, computers uh, first produce an automatic solution of the earthquake. So this happens in the, in the first minute that those waveforms are received. We have geohazards analysts who are on call 24 seven who are monitoring the system. They then identify that it's a real earthquake and the solution is deemed preliminary. And this then triggers the shape map process within the GeoNet system. For an earthquake to trigger shake map, uh, we need a couple of criteria. First is a magnitude criteria where if it's within 100 kilometers of the New Zealand coastline, if it's above magnitude 3.5, this will trigger a shake map and shaking layer process. For earthquakes further than 100 kilometers from the New Zealand coastline, uh, if the earthquake is above magnitude 5.0, then it will also trigger a shaking layers and shake map process. The distance away from New Zealand that we are considering is up through the Kermadex uh, just south of Tonga. So this captures large earthquakes that may occur on the Kermadex subduction zone. Once we have that first triggering of, of a shake map, we'll produce a, our first automated solution, which will have the uh, epicenter and magnitude information from the earthquake location system and strong motion data. If the magnitude or depth or location changes, this will trigger subsequent automatic runs. Likewise, if we receive new strong motion data, this will trigger subsequent automatic runs. So over those first few minutes, we may have multiple versions, but we always have a latest version, which is the latest run that's the best available information. If the earthquake is of significant uh, societal interest or, or very large, then our earthquake uh, experts panel will uh, review the earthquake and potentially update some of the information within the shape map software. This then turns into a reviewed run and we can do multiple reviewed runs and likewise these could be updated uh, if new information comes in through the earthquake location system as well. So this is really to highlight that there is no single one uh, shaking layer, there is multiple versions that occur over time. We anticipate the maps being available within 20 to 20, 10 to 20 minutes of an earthquake. Uh, likely it will be potentially within 10 minutes. Currently the system is run on what we call the tier two level within GeoNet, which is a very high reliability uh, system that's always up. But if something does go wrong, then we will support um, reviewing that uh, during uh, daylight hours. So 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., um, 365 days of the year. We are aiming to move to the tier one system, which would mean that it would have 24 hour support 365 days a year uh, into the near future. As I mentioned, uh, shaking layers can change over time. And so we really wanna highlight that, particularly for large or significant events, the first map that's produced could change with sub subsequent updates. An example here is for the Kaikoura earthquake in 2016, showing you on the left what the first map may have looked like when we just have the location of the epicenter. 
and what a subsequent map looked like when we have information on the fault rupture and strong motion data. And you can see that the distribution of shaking changes. So for example, the shaking in Christchurch is less intense uh, in the updated map. And likewise, the shaking in the upper South Island and in the Wellington region is higher as well. And so just being aware that maps change over time and always accessing the latest version will provide the latest updated map with the best information available. As I mentioned earlier, we use the shape map software that's been developed by the USGS as the calculation engine underlying shaking layers. ShakeMap is open source software that's been developed for over 20 years by the USGS. The USGS produces shake maps globally for magnitude five and above earthquakes. And they've been doing this for a number of years. And a number of national seismological agencies have their local versions of shake map, much like we're doing here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, and a running shape map. So there's a large community of users uh, of shape map and there's the sustainability behind the software as well. I'm going to briefly just cover how the system works. Um, but if you go to our website, which I'll show links later, you can delve into a bit more information if you're interested in getting into the finer details. So ShakeMap combines our ground motions that are recorded at seismic stations with ground motion predictive models. So a ground motion predictive model uh, is shown in the bottom figure where it can estimate the shaking for any magnitude at any distance for a number of different shaking intensity types. Uh, this model has a lot of uncertainty. And so what we do in ShakeMap is we use the observed data from the earthquake to help remove any bias or the uncertainty in our predictive models. We then combine this updated predictive model with uh, the shaking we observe at stations to help us calculate what the shaking is in between those. And so the way we do this is by weighting our observations from our stations and our predictions from our ground motion models. When we're very close to a station, the recording at that station will dominate the shaking contribution to the, shake, to the shaking layer. But as we move further away from a station, that predictive model will, will provide most of the information. We're calculating shaking layers on a one kilometer by one kilometer grid across Aotearoa, New Zealand. And for each of those grids, we have an estimate of the soil conditions, which, which helps us estimate the shaking and any amplification from soil as well. When we do have models, such as our ground motion predictive models, we're aligning those with what's used in the National Seismic Hazard Model, which was released last year. So we have alignment between the uh, models used in these two products. As I mentioned earlier, we can improve our shaking layers and shake maps with uh, new information, such as felt report information, uh, centroid moment tensions, which tell us the, the center of the earthquake and the, and, the, and the magnitude more accurately. We can also include fault rupture models, which tell us the extent of the shaking, uh, extent of the rupture, sorry. And if we have new station data that comes in. And our science is evolving in terms of this information and through the RCET uh, Endeavor program, we're aiming to produce these updated science models in a much faster time than we have in the past. So this will move from being updated within our uh, sort of 10 to 24 hours or days, moving that into, into minutes in near real time. So now I'm gonna talk about uh, the different types of information that Shaking Layer produces. So we have a, a number of different map types that come out of the tool. The first is ground shaking contour maps. So contours, uh, like we see in weather maps, represent areas of equal shaking. We also have heat maps for ground shaking. And these are, for the GIS people out there, these are raster maps, which are continuous grid of shaking values. We also have information on the ground shaking from our station data as well. So we can look at both the information from the maps uh, continuously or with contours, as well as our station data. And for our maps, particularly those ground shaking uh, heat maps, we also have an uncertainty map. So this tells us um, uh, around the uncertainty between observations and the predictive model. So 
right at a, a station, a seismometer station, the uncertainty will be close to zero. And as we move into an area of the map, which is based more on those predictive models, the uncertainty will increase. And so you can use this information uh, potentially within decision making in terms of giving you uh, where is the highest confidence in, in the map. In terms of formats, uh, we output in a number of different uh, open geospatial formats, uh, GeoJSON, as well as uh, an alternative shapefile for contours. For the heat maps and rasters, we produce these as GeoTIFFs and the station uh, data as GeoJSON file as well. Now, each of those types of maps is produced for a number of different shaking intensity measure types. So there's different ways that we can measure shaking. Uh, most commonly, people will be familiar with shaking intensity in the MMI, the Modified Mercalli Intensity Scale, which ranges from 1 to one to 10. And this is typically what's reported by GeoNet and, and you see in FAL reports. We also produce engineering-based parameters such as peak ground acceleration, which is in uh, units of gravity, spectral acceleration, which is the shaking at certain periods such as 0.3 second, 1 second, and 3 seconds, and peak ground velocity, uh, which is measured in centimeters per second. So there's four ways that we can access shaking layer information depending on your use and depending on your need. The first is uh, through the GeoNet Earthquake event page, which is the main GeoNet website where you might go and get information on the latest earthquake that's occurred. I'll take you through each of these different ones uh, following this slide. The second, uh, the GeoNet Earthquake event page is really designed for looking at the map, looking at this interactive map, uh, and getting an initial idea of, of the shaking uh, intensity maps. If you're wanting to use the data, then we have a shaking layers data website. And this is where you can go and download the, the underlying data for the maps uh, and use that in some other software potentially or, an, or analysis. If you don't want to do that manually, we have the shaking layers API which is an application programming interface that you can hook up to third-party applications to ingest shaking layers information in an automated process. And we've been working on a shaking layers GIS web service, which we're hoping to be available uh, by the end of 2023 or possibly early 2024, which will allow GIS users uh, to automatically ingest uh, shaking layers within their GIS workspaces uh, for analysis. So essentially removing steps or any manual steps um, for getting that data into works, workspaces. So first I'm gonna go through the GeoNet earthquake event page. So this was released on Tuesday. Some of you may or may not have, have seen that. Uh, so if you go to the GeoNet uh, earthquake page and click on an earthquake, you come up with this uh, information page here. And so this has been redesigned to fit with shaking layers, where we have the earthquake details, and now we have a number of cards um, that are shown uh, on this page. So we have a felt report card and a shaking layers card. So these different cards are really different information that you can delve a bit deeper in terms of this earthquake. And this change of design is, uh, will enable future products to also fit in within this. So um, the, you can access the shaking layers by either clicking on the tab at the top um, next to the overview tab, or you can click on the interactive map. When you do that, you get taken to a shaking layers map. So this is an interactive map that you can that you can uh, interact with, and I'll show you how you to do that in a moment. But I'll first take you over a layout of this page. So we have the main interactive map with layers and a legend. On the middle left, we have the details of this uh, shaking layers run. So this is the metadata of the version. So this will tell you if it's an automatic run or it's been reviewed by our GNS seismologists or it's been revised. And it will tell you the date uh, and time of that latest version. So the latest version is always provided on this GeoNet earthquake event page. You can access the data website and API either by clicking the technical tab at the top and, and then there'll be a link to take you there. Or we have a link in the bottom in the helpful links um, where you can click that and automatically get taken to the data. 
Likewise, in the helpful links down the bottom, there's some information on shaking layers uh, and some links to things like the shaking intensity uh, scale that GeoNet uses. If you click on the interactive map, uh, it's a Google map style interactive map that we're all familiar with. Uh, up the top left, we have a layers tab where you can turn on different layers. So we have the epicenter, we have contours and heat maps, as well as the station data as well. So you can toggle these on and off and have as many on as you'd like for your, your typical view. Uh, because the map's interactive, you can click on things like a contour and get out the shaking intensity for that contour band. Uh, and down the bottom right is a legend, which will change depending on which intensity types you have on. If you're wanting a, um, a map to use in a, in a report or, or um, any social media or news, you could take a screenshot of this map. If we turn on the heat map, um, so this is our continuous map of shaking intensity, uh, the heat map is also click clickable. So you can zoom in and click on any point and it will give you the value for that one kilometer grid cell in terms of the shaking intensity. So if we click on this point where that little pop-up box is, it tells us MMI4 and it's light shaking. If you're wanting to get information about stations, you can also click on a station and it will tell you the station code as well as the shaking intensity recorded at that station in different units. If you click on the name of the station, it will take you to the GeoNet uh, website for that station with metadata on that station location. On this interactive map, you can also toggle between the shaking layers and our traditional felt reports that um, people have typically been using. So on the right, we have a felt report map, and on the left, we have the shaking layers map as well. So you can click between both of those views. If you want to get more information uh, and download some of those data files through the data website, uh, you can follow those links uh, in that GeoNet page, or you can go directly to the URL, which is shakinglayers.geonet.org.nz and we'll provide this on our on our final slide so it'll be there for you to for, for you to see uh, this website is our data website which is really for um, cataloging all of our data for uh, shaking layers and um, if you followed the link you would go to a page that looks like on the right where you'll see access to the latest run files that you can download either as a package in a zip file or individually for, depending if you only want one So the data website is a place where you can search and download shaking layer data. You can go back and search by year or event ID, or you can see the earthquakes in the last 30 days that have produced shaking layer maps and query those. For those quakes in the last 30 days, we have uh, metadata that can be ordered. So for example, you could order by magnitude uh, by clicking the magnitude column, and it would either um, have it in descending or ascending. Likewise, with depth or region, you can find um, your the event that you're interested in by filtering that way. You can also access different versions. So the GeoNet website is always the latest version of the map. But if you're interested in seeing how the maps evolved over time or a previous version, you can access those previous versions uh, on the Shaking Layer data website as well. You can also access uh, the what we call uh, two different file sets. So, and I'll talk about these in a moment. We have our standard Shaking Layers outputs, and we also have all of the raw shape map outputs that are typically produced by Shake Map. You can also click on the view map to see a quick version of the latest uh, shaking intensity map. And this is what's produced automatically by shape map. And this is really for a way to do a sanity check of the data that's available. You might notice that on the GeoNet website, we have a slightly different color palette to what's produced by shape map. And this is because on GeoNet, we follow colorblind friendly color palettes. Uh, whereas the rainbow one that's typically used uh, on shape map is not colorblind friendly. And so keeping in line with the design criteria for GeoNet, we have that other color scale, whereas for the shape map products, we keep it in the, in the rainbow color scale. 
You can also go along one of the tabs at the top on this data website and get information on the API, which I'll show you briefly as well, as well as downloading and reading uh, the Shaking Layers documentation. So early on, I talked about how shake maps evolve over time and we create a new version for each uh, shaking layer product. If you click on the versions tab for a given event, you'll be given a list of all the different event runs for this particular earthquake. These are date time stamped and also contain the tag of the run type. So we can see that we have a number of automatic runs in this case. And then we have the most two latest ones are reviewed. So they've been reviewed and edited by a GNS seismologist. You can go into any of these uh, runs to download the data files, or you can download it as a single package. Likewise, you can click on the view map and get that MMI intensity map to see the difference quickly between these different versions. Now, earlier I just mentioned that we have two different file sets that are available. The standard shaking layer files are procured and supported by GeoNet, and the format of those is unlikely to change. And these file sets, we uh, are available through the shaking layers API, as well as obviously through the data website. And these are really files that uh, will have a very low probability of change. And so we can give users then the confidence of ingesting this information with unlikely changes to the file format. We also can download if we scroll to the bottom of this page where we have the list of files to the raw ShakeMap file set. So ShakeMap produces a number of different files and different formats and different units uh, of shaking. Uh, and for users that are familiar with these, they can go and download those files. Uh, and what we have done is actually converted some of these files into our standard shaking layer file set with the with common units and common formats um, for that API. But you can download both of these file sets. Up the top, we have a guidelines tab, which takes you to the documentation for shaking layers. So we have an overview of uh, some of the different metadata um, for the different files um, that you can go in and, and find out about, as well as a PDF of uh, shaking layer user guidelines. So this takes you over some of the information that I've presented in this talk, as well as some more information on how you can process um, the shaking layers files to produce different, different types of information and some case studies of how shaking layers have evolved over time uh, for different earthquakes in the past in New Zealand. The other way that you can access information is through the Shaking Layers API. So if you have a piece of software that would like to ingest Shaking Layers and produce some automatic processing, then the API is the uh, solution for that. This is uh, common to the other APIs uh, run by GeoNet, uh, and you can get the documentation for this uh, through the API documentation tab at the top of the data website page. You can get uh, metadata on different events that are available within Shaking Layers, the different versions, as well as a file list of uh, available data files that can be ingested through the API. And then finally, you can download the data files through the API as well. Now, the API is only available for that standard file set, which is what GeoNet uh, can give high confidence of, of a low probability of changes to these files. Over the past six months, we've been working with some of our GIS end users across emergency management and, and lifelines seeking feedback of what they would like to see in a GIS web service. We heard quite strongly from our emergency management sector that a GIS web service is really important for a product like this to remove any uh, overhead in a response uh, process for them. And so we've been working on how we might deliver this and seeking feedback from some of our end users. We're at the point now where we're starting to implement this, and we hope that we'll be able to offer that GIS web service in late 2023 or early 2024. 
And this is just an example of a mock-up of a um, ArcGIS online uh, dashboard that was created through a, through a pilot uh, web service page. So there's more to come. So at the moment, uh, Shaking Layers is only available on the GeoNet uh, desktop website. Now you can use that on a mobile phone through your browser on your mobile phone and the website will reconfigure to the size of your phone and is quite usable. But ideally we want to integrate Shaking Layers on the GeoNet mobile app, which many users work, um, use. For example, you could get a notification and then you'd be able to click and go straight to that um, straight to that page and look at the map um, as you would see on the GeoNet desktop uh, app. This is currently in, under development and hopefully we'll have this released by the end of this year. As I mentioned, the GIS web service is coming soon. We're also working uh, on how we can improve the speed uh, and accuracy of some of the earthquake parameters and data for significant events. So the RSET Endeavor program is working on a number of tools, which will see us being able to have those earthquake parameters in a, in a quicker time, which will help improve the accuracy of those early shake, shake maps and shaking layers. This will happen all behind the scenes, but we'll be notifying people as these science advances happen. At present, we're uh, manually including uh, GeoNet felt reports into shaking layers, uh, but we're also working to uh, ensure a process so we can automatically include uh, GeoNet felt reports in the maps as well. We're also working on a video for technical users, uh, which will come out on our Geo GNS Science uh, YouTube page. Uh, which will go over some guidelines of um, how to use the tool, um, particularly for our end user community. Um, thanks everyone for um, coming along today. Uh, here you have uh, the links to the uh, main site on GeoNet website and the data site. Uh, and you also have the uh, email if you have any further questions. Uh, we will keep informing you as you as we have new um, updates to the shaking layers tool. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.